Hello, Robert. This is the Hashtag Radio Show. This is actually not a radio show, but an emergency podcast. It's pod, emergency podcast number five. And um, I wish we weren't doing these podcasts, but I think we have to do them because you know a lot of people have no idea what's going on. So this is going to be more in depth of what's going on. So this is emergency podcast number five. You can you can you can see it again. To, you know, discuss it with your friends. Discuss what's happening. And what inspired it was a few nights ago. I was at a uh, the local like a Cheers bar where you know, my friends hang out, and I was talking to this attorney. I mean, he's running for attorney general, and things like this. I said, "How come? What's going on? How how come people aren't terrified?" And he he looked at me and says, "Because people don't care." He says, people don't care. They think they think tomorrow will be like yesterday. And the second thing that happened, another um, this woman asked me, she says, I see your podcast. And then and she went, she was asking me some questions. And then I asked her a question. I said, where is your money? You know, what bank is it being held in? And she froze. Why? Is the bank not safe? I said, well, I don't know unless you tell me. And she just froze. And I, I think just question her because she's she's hearing about the bank runs, but she has no not not an idea what's going on. So this emergency podcast number five is for for uh, Andy Sheckman, dear dear short time friend. We just met. We're like brothers, we share the same philosophy. He, he goes more into depth, and by the way, he's one of the one of the biggest gold and silver dealers in the world. I'm not recommending gold and silver. I just want to let you know that Andy does sell it. I buy from him. So with that said, we're going to go into what does this all mean? The first question is, we, we all heard about uh, Silicon Valley went down. Then we heard Credit Suisse went down. Those are big banks. But there was also the crash of the crypto with Sam Bankman fried And I'm old enough to remember the savings and loan crash. And there's no savings and loan today. They're gone. And people just sort of, once the panic's over, they forget about it. So this is why it's the emergency podcast number five. We're going into more depth about it. And the question is, where is your money? How safe is it? And what should you be doing? So, Andy, welcome to the program. Good to see your smiling face again. Robert, it's always great to be here and, and good to be back. And thank you for the kind introduction. I appreciate it very, very much. Sincere. So uh, explain something to us. We had, you have these big national banks. Everybody hears about you know, Jamie Dimon is uh, Goldman. No, he's a bank. What, what is he? Mark, J.P. Morgan. Anyway, yes. the, the mega, mega banks, there's a few of them. And then what happens is now the regional banks are starting to go. So, Andy, would you give the dis distinction between a national bank like Wells Fargo, I think Bank of America, and my neighborhood bank? Right? I, have, I have about three small banks within walking distance of my health. So what's the difference in the size of the banks? Well, you have, I mean, I guess the, the easiest way to say it is that they're just too big to fail, according to, to the Fed uh, or to the Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen. These large commercial banks, they're just, their balance sheets are just as corrosive and filled with toxic assets as the smaller banks. But because they are so systemically tied to one another, as, as the Treasury Secretary calls them, systemically too big to fail, like Credit Suisse was, uh, they will be bailed out. So they're just these behemoth banks that have created balance sheets that are so intertwined with one another systemically that if they fail, it would have ramifications for the entire global financial system. I mean, that's just the easiest way to... There are other distinctions that you could make and differences that you could make between the regional banks, the nearly 5,000 regional banks, and the five or six massive behemoth commercial banks like Wells, like JP, or JM, excuse me, uh, JP Morgan, uh, like Goldman Sachs, uh, like Citibank, like Bank of America. These large, too big to fail commercial banks are more or less being backstopped and guaranteed by the Federal Reserve. Well, the rest of the banks, as we were told by Janet Yellen, if they're not too systemically large, as the majority of them are not, they won't be bailed out. They'll be bailed in 
where the depositors are general creditors of the bank and the money that you deposit really belongs to the bank and not to you. You are a creditor of the bank. And if they go under, instead of being bailed out the way that Silicon Valley Bank was because many politicians had their money there and the big startup money for Silicon Valley, whatever the reason they bailed it out, it shouldn't have been bailed out according to the new laws. But these other banks, if they go under, you will be bailed in, which means all of the depositors' money goes into the kitty to bail in the the poor decisions and investments of those banks. And anything left over then gets given back out in a pro rata fashion, along with shares of what is a defunct bank. It's, so uh, it's a very why, that's situation. Why Biden, that's why Biden and Yellen said the taxpayer won't cost any money to them. If your money is in a bank, like Bank of Hawaii is one of those regional banks. Right. And Hawaii is a big bank. Was it Pacific Western Bank? So these are regional banks. So if your money is in there, <clears throat> that means your savings then goes to bail out the bank, not the taxpayer. Am I correct on that? That's exactly correct. That is exactly correct. You, you bail in instead of bail out. It's what happened in Cyprus. It's more or less the exact same thing that would happen in in bankruptcy proceedings where you know the money is used instead of in, instead of making uh, certain people whole the money is used to make everyone whole in a pro rata fashion <clears throat> and so people deposit their money in the bank <clears throat> they think it belongs to them it's there when you need it but really that's not the case <clears throat> now if the bank goes under again you are an unsecured general creditor and it goes back really to uh, the the um, the meeting or the inquiry that the, the House had where the, the representative from Oklahoma asked uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen, he said, uh, Madam Secretary, you just bailed out Silicon Valley Bank. And we were under the impression that bail that bailouts were no longer part of the game, that these are bail-ins. So being that you did that, let me ask you a question. If one of my regional banks in Oklahoma fails, Will my depositors, will my constituents in the state of Oklahoma be made whole? And her answer was no. She said no. In fact, it will take a uber majority of the FOMC, which is the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, myself and the president, to determine if those banks are indeed systemic enough to warrant being bailed out. And really that lit a fuse under the regional banks. And that's where the story begins. And I think this is is part and parcel with why we've seen so much money leave the regional banks and move towards the safety of the too big to fail banks. Now, there are other reasons which we'll get into, namely the reverse repo market, the money market accounts. Wait, 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 wait. We're going too far. Okay. So what that means, if you're, um, you're living in Podunk, wherever you are, and you, you have a half million dollars, your business is attached to the bank, you know, your payroll's in there, you have employees, you have their savings and all this, and you have a half million dollars in cash in there. If bank XYZ, regional bank, crashes, what happens to your 500000 Well, we're supposedly told that 250000 of it is covered by FDIC, which certainly is something I want to talk about. But the other $250,000 would go into the kitty. So in theory, you get your 250000 insured by FDIC. The other $250,000 then goes into, in essence, bankruptcy proceeding where it is used to bail in the inequities of the bank. Hopefully there's something left over and anything that is left over goes out in a pro rata fashion to all of the people who then bailed in the bank. Right. There's something else that happens when a regional bank, like Bank of Hawaii, and I have one cross something bank here, when they go out, that means the company can't make payroll and things like this. Of course. Is that what it means? Absolutely. Your, your business accounts are treated no differently than your personal accounts. And this is something that's really very scary, especially when you realize, Robert, that the regional banks represent 70% of all the small business loans in the United States. And for years, forever, Small businesses in this country represented over 40% of the GDP in the United States. So realizing that these banks in their hands hold the majority of all the small businesses in this country, it's a very frightening thing if you own a small business and have your money 
in what amounts to any bank other than a commercial bank. And really a lot of people do because these are the banks, and we've talked about this before, you talk about the small banks that are in your neighborhood, real close to the places you frequent. Well, the, the places you frequent, they go in and they make they have relationships with these small banks. These small banks make loans to small businessmen and women based less upon balance sheet and business plan and more about upon relationships. In many cases, like you said, you went to the bar, your, your local Cheers bar. A lot of times people go to the local Cheers bar on a Friday night and sit down with their banker. Hey, how you doing? You know, I coach your kid in T-ball and, you know, I, we've known each other forever and ever. That's what these small banks really are all about, relationships and how that has helped foster the small businesses in this country. Very scary point. I'm glad you brought that up because really it's, a, it's probably one of the biggest issues with the small regional banks running into trouble. And how many real estate loans are attached more to the regionals than to the big nationals? Well, it, probably close to 70% of all the commercial leases, the majority of all the commercial real estate in this country is, is held on the, the balance sheets of these regional banks. Not the huge skyscrapers, but just about everything else. The leases and all of the, the commercial real estate that you see up and around your area the majority of it is held by the regional banks. And when you put the stressors in on top of what's going on now, the fact that the last three years, people learn that they don't need to be in an office building in order to be productive. You know, commercial real estate is something that's really facing some severe stress and you add on to it. Now, rising interest rates, as a lot of these, these leases reset, Rising interest rates, the ramifications that further stress on the, the uh, commercial banking industry will have on these regional banks. It's only pouring gasoline on, on what is, in essence, a fire that is growing by the day. And the other thing is that uh, I was, I don't, I don't know the numbers are accurate, but it said in New York City, the amount of office space available is equivalent to 34 skyscrapers, 34 Empire State Buildings. Yeah, I believe it. I, I believe it. Um, you know, my son works for Price Waterhouse and he only has to be in a massive, one of the biggest accounting firms in the world. And he only has to be in the office two days a week. Right. Yeah, I think that's exactly what's happening. And the people realize that they can be every bit as productive outside the office as inside the office. And that's putting a tremendous amount of strain on, on you know, the ability to not only service these leases, but what happens when the leases come up? These companies will say, you know what, we're going to let go of our lease. What happens to these loans that are, you know, based upon assumptions of, uh, of full capacity? We're anywhere near that. And it's just spiraling. And, you know, it, it's something that I think will continue to, to become a real big problem, especially as rates continue to rise and leases reset. It's a problem. It's not a problem that's going away anytime soon. In fact, I think it will increase as the months roll on here. So before we go to break right now, I want you to think about this. This guy claims, and I could be inaccurate on it, 34 Empire State Buildings are empty in New York City. That is how much. And that goes to another asset class called REITs, Real Estate Investment Trusts. So all of these REITs that are sitting in somebody's pensions or their 401k, they're toast. So that's that's why I was listening to that one person saying, oh, don't worry, the, the Fed's got us. He's bailed out, you know, uh, Silicon Valley Bank. I said, I don't think it's over. And the reason we have this emergency podcast is so you can prepare <clears throat> for hopefully it doesn't happen, but for what is coming. Personally, I'm such a pessimistic, fat, fuzzy bear. I don't see how they're going to get us out of this mess. So I'd rather have you have some ideas what you can do. Like I said, when I talked to that woman, I said, what bank, what bank do you hold? It was a very simple, what, what bank do you, is your money at? She looked at me I said, and she couldn't think. She said, I should have got my money out. I said, I didn't say anything. What bank? And so like you, in your business with the gold business, people are pulling money out of banks into the gold right now. So we come back, we'll be talking more about what you can do. <clears throat> this is emergency podcast number five. But what happens when the regional banks come down, the little neighborhood banker? And then what happens to what? why is the money not coming into the economy? The economy stays with the rich. 
One last point about this. <clears throat> During COVID, small businesses shut down, but Walmart and Amazon didn't. So that's too big to fail. They didn't dare shut those guys down, but so many small retailers got their ass handed to them. And this is very similar to a regional bank failures coming up. And like, you know, I'm, I'm flying to Hawaii in a couple of days, you know, Bank of Hawaii is on that list. And that's, that's, that bank handles the Pacific. So this is not a small thing. These regional banks going down and Janet Yellen not going to bail them out or the Fed or the FDIC not going to bail them out. What does that mean to you and me? We'll be right back. Robert already warned us, 2023 is going to be the year of lost wealth. After all, Goldman Sachs predicts you'll see zero returns from stocks for the rest of 2023. And investors like you have already made a record number of emergency hardship withdrawals from the 401ks. Now a stunning survey reveals that over half the Americans making six figures are living paycheck to paycheck, combined with tens of thousands of layoffs in just the last few weeks. It becomes clear that a financial storm is brewing and nobody is safe. But if you think brilliant investors like Robert are letting their money waste away in a 60-40 portfolio, think again. For years, Robert and other experts have been investing millions into low correlation assets that can still climb when the stock market flatlines. And according to a recent Citibank report of the major asset classes, the lowest correlation belongs to art. That's right. Contemporary art prices have outpaced the S&P 500's total return turn over the last 26 years by 131%. Now you can enter this market without needing millions, thanks to Masterworks, our longtime partner. Their platform lets you invest in shares of paintings by icons like Picasso and Banksy. Every single one of Masterworks' 12 exits to date have delivered positive returns to their investors, with their last two sales returning 10 and 35% net. In fact, just since our last episode, Masterworks sold a Another offering, handing back a 15.4% net profit after just 36 days. No wonder over 680,000 users have invested more than half a billion dollars on Masterworks. Offerings have sold out in minutes, but Rich Dad listeners can skip the waitlist by going to masterworks.art slash richdad. That's masterworks.art slash richdad. See important disclosures at masterworks.com slash cd if you're concerned about high inflation looming recession a stock market correction or out of control spending in washington this is an important message to hear because the fact is during every major crisis in u.s history many of those who failed to prepare watch their savings investments or retirement funds go down while many with the foresight to own gold helped preserve their purchasing power. Gold even made some folks richer. Now we're facing several major crises at once, and experts say we may soon face even more economic trouble. So please don't wait. Learn the simple way you can diversify with gold and put yourself on the road to financial peace of mind, even in uncertain times. The new free 2023 Gold Guide from our friends at Gold Alliance can show you how. Just visit www.freegoldguide.com slash Robert or call 1-800-473-4585. Republican governor and conservative commentator Mike Huckabee says Gold Alliance is the only gold provider he recommends to his friends and family. Find out why and visit freegoldguide.com slash Robert or call now at 1-800-473-4585. Feeling powerless over current events and your financial future? Financial freedom is your freedom. Robert Kiyosaki is the best-selling author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Over 40 million people have taken Robert's advice. Now it's your turn. Attend Robert's free virtual wealth building event. Claim your free access now at richdadfree.com. Don't wait, access is limited. Go to richdadfree.com. That's richdadfree.com. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. This is not a radio show. This is emergency podcast number five because the economy is changing its high, high speed. Special guest and special friend is Andy Sheckman. And we're talking about what are you going to do? I hear so many people saying, well, what's the Fed going to do? What's Janet Yellen, Secretary of Treasury, going to do? The issue right now is what are you going to do? And as you know, there's two Americas today, those with money and those without. 
<clears throat> and the number went out a lot. But those with money, like a friend of mine just sold his business. I think he put a, almost a billion dollars in his pocket. Wow. He doesn't he doesn't know where to hide the money, Andy. You know, Kim, Kim and I have lots of cash also. We we have to run around looking for places to stand on to the <clears throat> 250,000 debt limit. And then there's the masses of people with nothing. And if a regional bank goes down, the bank on your corner goes down, that real estate's no good. Employees get fired and all this. So the ripple effect or the dominoes start to fall. And so that's why I have Andy Sheckman here. And would you, before we go any further, please tell us what Miles Franklin does. Give you a commercial message here. Sure. We uh, were a precious metals company, been in business since uh, 1989, um, 33 years. Um, never had a customer complaint ever in 33 years and $9 billion in sales and very proud of our reputation of our U.S. Mint accreditation as one of only 27 resellers in the world. And um, just very proud to be here and, and uh, be associated with what you're trying to do. It, it's it's uh, it really is very important that people understand what's happening right now, Robert. And, and for those people that are looking to protect themselves with precious metals the way the central banks are, certainly we would be more than happy to, uh, to, to make it a wonderful experience. I'll make darn sure of that. Okay, thank you. And again, Rich Dad doesn't recommend anything. We're, a, we're an education company. But just for full disclosure, when Kim and I started realizing we had too much money in too many banks, what do you do with it? So it's, it's, a, it's a good problem to have too much cash, but where do you place it? So we've placed a lot of money with Andy. The good thing about his service, he also stores it for you because I, I don't want to be on, on this YouTube saying, yeah, I got a couple of million of gold sitting at my house. Somebody will come visit me pretty quickly. Yeah, we do offer storage as well with Brinks, and I think we're the envy of the storage industry. We have the only fixed rate storage program in the country. So for those that want storage, that's something we can we can help you with too. And you know, you just mentioned something, Robert, if I may, about the FDIC, uh, about the FDIC covering 250,000 per account. It's interesting to note that at the end of 2022, the FDIC had assets of just over $128 billion. But if you look at the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, you'll notice that they just loaned the FDIC $173 billion. What that tells me is that the actual cash needs of bailing out SVB and Signature Bank alone would have more than exhausted all of the FDIC's deposits. And I find it interesting that the Federal Reserve is lending money to the FDIC. And if you realize, if you take away the commercial banks and say there's roughly $9 trillion in deposits in the regional banks, how is it that $128 billion or even $173 billion, if you take the loan that they were given by the Fed, Fed loaning money to the FDIC is kind of crazy to me. But even if you take that, how the hell does that backstop $9 trillion in deposits? It doesn't. And so this FDIC illusion of safety is something that I think people will realize uh, is nothing more than the Federal Reserve standing behind them with the printing press waiting to destroy the value of the dollar even further if we see more and more of these regional banks fail, which I expect they will. And what, what Andy is saying is that I was on television talking to somebody, I forget this years ago, and I'm always going, uh, I help a little coin is, three dollars for a silver eagle and today that same silver eagle is 35 dollars and i said what happened did the eagle get bigger or the purchasing power of your dollar go down and that's why the question is not, not about what what's the fed going to do what's the treasurer going to do what's wall street going to do what can people do right now because um you know when i when i recommend you know, you know i've talked about this i recommend gold and silver but people's eyeballs glaze over and they don't, they don't want to touch it. So gold and silver coins, real coins, no counterparty risk to them. That means you, it's in your hands, it's in your hands only. Okay. So what else can the people do, Andy? Because if there's just runs on these banks, which I hope I'm wrong, but I think are coming, they can't stop what's happening right now. They no, cannot. they can't. In fact, at the end of 2022, there was a report that just came out 
by the Federal Reserve, who said that 722 banks were technically insolvent at the end of 2022. Um, and that means that that they had at least 50 percent of their capital uh, was underwater. And these are called unrealized losses, whereby, you know, of course, the rising interest rates have created significant strain on this. But if they were to get a run on, you know, on the deposits where, where the depositors request redemption, the only thing that they would have been able to do at this point or any of these 722 banks would be able to do would be to sell those assets that are underwater. And that's why we saw in 36 hours it put Silicon Valley Bank just like that out of business. So there's a lot of these banks that are that are underwater technically. So what do you do? You well, mean, and, and, the, funny, the funny thing about Silicon, not funny, but Silicon Valley Bank, who was running first? The officers, mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're getting their money out of their own bank before everybody else did. Well, I make that same analogy to the central banks buying record gold for the last 18 months, more than any time in history. Why? What do they see coming? They're front running as well. The people right. who have the most wait, wait, wait. money. Ex- explain what front running means. It's, one yeah, of my favorite. It's, it's the people who have the most money are also closest to the information. So it's like a football game. In the huddle, you know where the play is. So you can front run the route. The defense has to react. They are front running an outcome that they know is inevitable. And I think that's really the scariest thing of all is that if you realize that these these insiders were selling or that the central banks are buying gold, the question is why? Why are they doing something early when it doesn't really make sense to the masses because they know the information and they're able to get in front of what's coming before it becomes obvious to everybody else. Yeah, and I kind of hope I'm wrong, but I was listening to Stan Druckenmiller. And there's one smart dude, boy, is he a smart dude. And he was talking about how we're right now, a 30 foot tidal wave is hitting us now, we're in it. But what he also said is the the tsunami is coming. Mm So right now we're panicking and all this stuff, but we still have time. But the tsunami is coming. I guess I hope I'm wrong. Yeah, I hope you're wrong too. Unfortunately, I don't think you are. And what a lot of these people are doing, you ask what can be done if not to buy metals. It's what everyone else has been doing, pulling their money out of the uncertainty of the regional banks and moving it to the handful of the commercial banks and into the safety and if you will, the daily liquidity of the money market accounts that are paying 5% when you can't get that, even in a CD, uh, the highest rate CD you get might come close to that, but you're locked in for a year in a regional bank that we are told will not be bailed out if they fail. So you have the risk of the bank, you have not getting the same return you can get in a commercial bank, and you have not the daily liquidity because you put it in a CD, you're locked in for six months or a year to get those rates. Whereas the money market accounts right now are offering daily liquidity in a bank that's too big to fail. It's scary because these are the banks that have massive derivative positions. JP Morgan has over 50 trillion in derivatives. These are the banks that everyone ran away from into the regional banks because they, the perception was that they were much safer and we always thought they were until we find out they're not. I I just can't believe this is going on. So what else can people do? Do do you know what I mean? Like you can hold it in cash. Like Jim Jim Records says, you know, buy uh, antique art, you know, master's paintings, anything that will hold its value. But if you have very little money, what can you do? Do you have any ideas for them? You know, short of buying gold and silver, Robert, and and tangibles, assets, if you look at the wealthy, the wealthy own assets. It's not massive bank accounts as much as it is assets that feed you and liabilities that eat you. I guess what can people do? They can get out of variable rate debt, first and foremost, as rates rise, that variable date, uh, that variable rate debt increases. You can buy silver as often as you can, even if it's just a few ounces at a time, you want to get out of the way. And I keep, you know, ever since you introduced me to, to Buckminster Fuller, 
And the one comment that you made that really continues to go through my head over and over and over and over again, as someone who's loved baseball my whole life and thinking of standing in a batter's box against Randy Johnson wearing a blindfold, you can't get out of the way of what you don't see coming is what he said. And if most people don't see what's coming, they can't get out of the way of it. If you're listening to this, if you have the ability to own some precious metals, do so because as Robert said, it is an asset that is not simultaneously someone else's liability. The concept of counterparty risk is something that's going to become more and more and more entrenched in people's psyche as we see more and more banks fail and what it means to be involved in an asset or in, in an instrument that contains counterparty risk. Because if a counterparty fails, what does that mean to you and the asset that you hold that is valued upon the counterparty's ability to perform? Not so good. So removal of counterparty risk, removal of variable rate debt, <clears throat> removal from the system best you can is where you start. And depending upon your means, well, then you have different different ways of achieving that. But I think removal of counterparty risk being the primary objective in all of this, because you know what? It's one thing for me to say the stock market's overvalued or the real estate market's overvalued or the bond market is overvalued and risky. And they all are. It's another thing to say that the money that you're holding for your business, for your family, in your in your 529 plan, for your kids' education, that it's all in a very precarious position inside what amounts to almost 5,000 banks that have been the backbone of the U.S. economy for a very long time. Those are the regional banks. Yes, sir. That's right. And all the employees that work there. Correct. Absolutely. And all the loans that they hold or, or you know, if you're a farmer and you have all of, all of your, all of the money that you have and the loans that you have to to, to, to plant your field and harvest it and buy the combine and all of these things, you know, the amount of credit that is needed to bring a loaf of bread to market is extraordinary. If you think about it, the farmer who's using the regional bank has a loan or a line of credit to buy the combine, to buy the diesel fuel, to buy the seeds, to plant the field. When the, when he harvests the wheat, he, he gives it to a trucking company who has loans from regional banks for the trucks and the diesel fuel, who then trucks it to the to the flour mill, who has loans with the regional bank on operations and employees and all of these things. And then that goes back to the trucking company once it's refined, who has loans. And then that goes to the groceries or to the baker, who has loans to run his bakery uh, and, and, and money held at the regional banks to run the bakery. And then that goes to the grocery store, buy truck again. The okay. amount of credit that is used to plant a... To plant wheat and turn it into bread and bring it to the grocery store is extraordinary. Let me say what Andy's saying. What he's saying is a regional bank in your area goes down. Your town goes down with it. Yeah. Because there's no there's no more credit going into the market. And when that happens, it goes to depression. And that's what we're sitting on the we're sitting on the edge of not not a recession, but a possible great depression. And that's my concern. I have a final question which always confused me. Oh, by the way, George Gammon had a flash crash emergency also. I, uh, I couldn't believe the chart he was showing us, but I'm going back and look at it. I just looked at it before I came in here. But the other thing, too, is people say buy short-term treasuries or T-bills. And I don't like anything that's printed, as you know. I like, I want to see, touch, and feel it. So would buying short-term treasuries protect? You at all in this? Well, episode. it's interesting you say that. And I saw your tweet the other day, and I found your tweet to be very timely, where you showed how the rate on the one year note spiked. Why would that be? On the one month note, rather. Why would that be where the one month note is paying over 5%? Because what that's saying is that if you're getting that high and it spiked that high, what that's telling you is that there's a good deal of concern that the federal government defaults here in about a month, on, in June 1st, and that would coincide almost exactly with the last treasury auction, where people aren't going to get their money. Now, what we're talking about here is not a real default, but it's called a technical default, whereby, and if you look at the credit default swaps on this, on the treasury market, they've gone way up. Meaning 
the people who are buying insurance on this happening, the price is going way up. And so is the rate on the one month treasury. Because what it's basically saying is, okay, you can buy this treasury. Normally the rate would be much lower, but because it shot so far up, that means people are very concerned that we see a technical default. The difference between a technical default and an outright default, an outright default means all hell breaks loose, that we just default on everything, right? Here's your reset. A technical default means, okay, well, they're not gonna pay you things on time. Maybe a month down the road, they get their act in order. The, the Republicans and Democrats can agree on a balanced budget, or I mean, on a raising the debt ceiling rather. Uh, we haven't had a balanced budget in 25 years. So let's just say they agree to raise the debt ceiling again, which was a joke, uh, and then they resume paying their, their commitments. But what that's basically saying is that we're gonna jack up the rate on the one month to entice you to take the risk of buying that bond and maybe not getting your payment in June because we just had the, the, the last treasury auction a few days ago, you may not get your, your payment in June if, the, if there's a technical default. Now they have the printing press, they can always print more, but this impasse on the debt ceiling uh, is something where you could experience and the traders are more or less, when you look at the credit default swaps, they're saying, we're gonna see a technical default they're going to shut things down for a period of time. And what does that mean to the coupon that you're supposed to get back on the one month treasury? So you're right, this is for the very first time, people have to be very concerned about what does that mean for the treasuries that you hold if the government shuts down, if the debt ceiling isn't raised. And I'd like to just make one other point about the debt ceiling. You know, last time they raised the debt ceiling, it, it was, Janet Yellen said, we have to take extraordinary measures to do so. And it was it was very hard to find what those extraordinary measures were. I found it in a Yahoo Finance article after doing a tremendous amount of digging. She had to borrow money from the Civil Servants Retirement Fund, the Disabled Veterans Retirement Fund, and the Postal Workers Retirement Fund just to raise the debt ceiling so that we could vote to give more money to the Ukraine, including money to their their, their government pensions when there's a $1.75 trillion pension shortfall here in this in this country. And it, it, the decisions that are being made by our leaders are, are just absolutely insane, which, which reminds me, I, if we have time, I'd love to just mention a quick thing about the new top economic advisor that President Biden just, just nominated. His name is Jared Bernstein. And if we have time, I'd love to just mention one what's, quick thing. What's his name? Jared Bernstein. And he was just nominated as Biden's top economic advisor. Now, there was another inquiry that was just made not too long ago where one of the representatives um, was, was, was asking, uh, I believe it's the head of the, either the CFTC or I think it was Gary Gimsler, actually, who, who was being questioned. And he, he said, do you realize, Mr. Gimsler, that the gentleman that uh, President Biden just nominated as his top economic advisor, wrote a report in 2014 called, called The King Dollar No More. In it, he advocates that the United States must actively take steps to remove the U.S. dollar as the global reserve currency. And Biden just nominated him as a top economic advisor. When you look at the foolhardy, stupid things that we keep doing, Boy, it sure makes sense that this guy would be the top economic advisor if indeed you wanted to find all sorts of decisions over the last few years to relinquish the dollar as the world reserve currency. And this is what we've been talking about on several of the other podcasts we've done. Boy, you just hired the right guy. And, and I think people need to buckle up. Things are not going to get smoother and better anytime soon with people like this running the show. Now, the problem is getting bigger, too. So I'll just close with this. There's so much we could go into this whole thing. I, I, you know, I love this subject because I, I get to see the future. But I, as a kid, you know, I was in a, probably a fifth grade or something. I read about the Weimar Republic, and the Weimar Republic, you know, uh, was Germany lost World War One, and so France, England, and America punished Germany. It says you have to pay us your money. So the Weimar Republic, which was Germany, went broke. And so they, had, they didn't have any money. So they printed and printed and printed and printed and printed. And there's pictures all over the world, wheelbarrows full of money. 
And what you've been saying a number of times, Andy, is uh, my question is this. Some of the people listening right now say, oh, that'll never happen. But is it possible that people will be driving wheelbarrows pretty soon full of cash that has been devalued because they print too much money? Well, I don't know that it'll be because they print too much money. I think that will certainly have a, 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 a profound effect on the value of the dollar. But as we've talked about before, this growing cohesion around the world of countries joining together against the Western okay. hegemony. If they dump dollars, if OPEC and Saudi Arabia, which if you look at the things that are happening, Saudi Arabia, all of the things that they've done, including just joining the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, meaning they're now being protected by China as well, not just Russia. And if you look, they've joined the BRICS, they've joined the Belt Road, they told the folks at Davos they're open to taking other currencies. And as we've talked about in podcasts two, three, and four, what makes the dollar the world reserve amongst many other things, the biggest thing is the fact that Saudi Arabia and OPEC price it in oil, price oil in dollars. If that ends, and it looks like it's going to based upon all of the moves and pieces that are being put into place, bang, like that. There's your tsunami, there's your 30 foot tidal wave of dollars that hit our shore. And when that happens, that becomes hyperinflation. Now here's the, the piece that people don't put two and two together. When you have massive, massive, massive inflation, you must allow the market to revalue interest rates commensurate with the inflation. You can't have 5% interest rates with 25% inflation or you have Weimar Republic where your currency is losing five times its value every year. Instead, interest rates would have to spike to the moon to compensate for the loss of purchasing power that inflation creates, hyperinflation. And when that happens, that's when you see wheelbarrows worth of dollars being used to buy a McDonald's hamburger and you go in to see if there are any hamburgers and you come out and the cash is laying on the ground and the wheelbarrow was stolen. That's exactly how it would happen if the world dumps dollars because they don't need to own it. Remember that every country in the world has had to own it for 50 years to buy oil. If that changes, and I believe in my soul, it's going to change. When that happens, when that moment happens, that's the moment, that's the Klaus Schwab moment where everything in this country that makes people feel rich is inversely correlated to a massive spike in interest rates. And you can see just by raising interest rates the way that Powell has in a very, I don't know, non-aggressive way. Yes, it's gone up fast, but we're still well below the rate of inflation. It's breaking the banking system. What happens if rates really go up like Paul Volcker did in 1980, who, by the way, Powell says it's his idol, his hero, his mentor. Will you raise rates to 18 percent the way Volcker did and it will vaporize the entire U.S. economy and, and a lot of the global economy? And maybe that's what they have in mind, I don't know. But God forbid that happens. Everything that's going on inside this country will look like a sideshow. And, and I wonder sometimes if what is going on inside this country and our foreign creditors are watching it, if that isn't only exacerbating this final moment where the dollar is no longer the singular sole settlement currency for oil through OPEC. And that is the one moment that I'm most concerned of. So everybody, this is a pod, emergency podcast number five. We've covered some of this in previous podcasts, one, two, three, and four. If you have, you know, if it's of interest to you, please look, check out one, two, three, four. Use this podcast, discuss it with friends and family. You know, some people will say it's full of it and all this. But like I said, Rich Dad doesn't give investment advice. But if you're insistent that your money is as safe as cash in the bank, my investment advice for you is, buy a wheelbarrow. Mm -hmm. Thanks for watching the show. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Robert.